Hi, I'm Simon Widow, Manager of HPA's Agronomic Services Group. Uh, thanks for taking the time to learn about our sustainability initiatives. Over the last couple of years, we've been able to allocate more resources to this very important area, and we're excited to tell you all a bit more about it. I think it's important to say that a lot of this work has been collated by George Webster in the last 12 months, and he couldn't be with us today, so I'm subbing in for George. As the largest hop grower in Australia, it's important for HBA to consider the environmental, economic and social impact of every decision we make. We are committed to improving our business practices based on the corporate social responsibility framework set out in the Global Reporting Initiative Standards. HPA, as a regional representative of the broader Bath Haas Group, is also a participant in the UN Global Compact which we use to evaluate our business operations, manage risk and identify opportunities for corporate responsibility regarding global issues of human rights, labour, environment and anti-corruption. We use the UN Global Compact, Global Reporting Initiative Standards and opinions of internal and external stakeholders to create a materiality matrix of our environmental, economic and social responsibilities for growing sustainably. At the end of this year, we intend to publish our initial report on our sustainability initiatives in relation to the key metrics identified in the materiality matrix. The key criteria that we are reporting on will be our employees, community engagement, stakeholder dialogue, resource management and suppliers and customers. These criteria are based on HPA's core values and objectives with input from the broader Bath Haas Group. HPA promotes a healthy company culture through social events, internal policies and a vested interest in the mental and physical health of our employees. We comply with all state and federal regulations, including statutory inspections, safeguards, danger signals, controlled handling of dangerous substances, measures against dangerous work and compliance with protective equipment to ensure everyone returns home in the same state they arrived in. HPA ensure fair business practices are observed as they provide the necessary framework for remaining vigilant against competition law violations, insider trading, price manipulation, conflicts of interest and systems for responding to complaints outside the company. We have also installed a whistleblower policy that protects people who report wrongdoing either internally or externally. This document can be found on our website. HBA have developed enterprise agreements for farm employees in accordance with the guidance of the Australian Fair Work Commission and the relevant union representation. This provides better quality of life for our employees, as well as better socio-economic outcomes for families and communities. We are also committed to employee development and career advancement, ensuring that opportunities such as training and promotions are provided equally. And we are continuing with COVID safe plans this year, which is the reason why we are bringing the farm to you through a virtual harvest. At HPA, we aim to be a positive presence by engaging with local events, volunteer groups and sponsorship of sporting clubs, including but not limited to the Bushy Park Show, Myrtleford Festival, Bushy Park Fire Brigade, Ovens Robin Fire Brigade and Rotary, all of which enrich the communities in which we operate. HPA always carries out farming operations in a way that is mindful of others who live and work in the area. We also support the development of our local communities with job creation, skill development and priority purchasing of local products and services from businesses such as EE Muir, Tafco and Alpine Mapping to name a few. HPA has also worked with local councils and community groups to improve shared resources, protecting the health of our waterways and the biodiversity hotspots that fringe our farms. The customer experience is fundamental to our strategy for sustainable growth. We can enhance this experience by always being aware of the environmental impact, social impact or impact on customer products. We are happy to share information about the standards to which our products are held with our brewing customers. HPA also ensure the quality and safety of our products are regulated through a mix of audits and third party accreditations. Our virtual harvest session on quality assurance goes into the certificates, policies and statements listed on the right in more detail, and they are also available on our website. HPA maintains active memberships with relevant industry bodies to stay current and contribute to the discourse and new developments. 
We're members of the American Society of Brewing Chemists, or ASBC, that helps improve and bring uniformity to the brewing industry on a technical level. The Independent Brewers Association Australia, or IBA, that helps build a strong, sustainable future for our industry under the vision of quality, independent beer. The Institute of Brewing and Distilling, or IBD, that helps advance education in the sciences of brewing, fermentation and distilling. The Australian Sustainable Agricultural Initiative, or SAI, that provides practical and commercial perspectives on issues and policies that impact the agricultural sector and food and beverage production in Australia. SEDEX, which is a third party auditor that improves management of supply chains in line with the UN Global Compact and Global Reporting Indicators. And the UN Global Compact that ensures corporate responsibility including vigilance against corruption in all its forms. The SEDEX auditing program provides transparency and preserves human rights throughout our supply chain. HPA sourced the most environmentally friendly packaging whenever and wherever possible. Our suppliers meet the requirements of the Australian Standard for Sustainable Forests Timber and Paper and Forest Stewardship Council certification. We also contract third parties to collect our reusable waste streams. Recycle collects our scrap metal. TerraCycle collects our single-use plastics, specifically Ziploc bags and gloves that are used for lab analyses. And AgSafe product stewardship program collects our empty agricultural chemical containers. We employ various methods to manage soil health on our farms. Cover crops, predominantly cereal ryegrass, are used to improve soil health. We also undertake annual soil tests to establish nutrient levels, which inform future fertilizer applications. Water management is becoming increasingly important with the changing climate. HPA use in-field probes to continuously monitor and report soil moisture levels, which ensures our irrigation systems are working efficiently and effectively. We continually assess our irrigation needs using climate data, moisture probes and crop surveys during critical growth stages. In Victoria, we're planning for an additional 300 megalitre dam that will help protect the flow of the Ovens River, which also sustains local flora, fauna and recreation. And in Tasmania, we've worked with local council groups to manage and restore biodiversity of the riparian zones on farm. HPA recently replaced all our metal halide lights that contain dangerous heavy metals with LED lights that are far more energy efficient. This has reduced our power consumption by 68% and our carbon dioxide emissions by 220 tonnes across our farms each year. The largest drop was in Victoria where the primary source of electricity is derived from coal, compared to Tasmania where the primary source of electricity is hydroelectric. HPA engaged an environmental consultancy firm to perform an on-farm energy assessment of part of the Agricultural Energy Investment Plan funded by the Department of Jobs, Precincts and Regions. The AEIP support farmers in identifying and implementing energy efficient opportunities with the aim of building greater energy resilience in the agricultural sector. It focused on farm energy use trends and also included a pre-feasibility study for switching from LPG to a less carbon intensive fuel for the purpose of drying hops. This graph shows the energy consumption breakdown for our Victorian farm. LPG is the major form of on-farm energy consumption, contributing 67% of overall energy needs. The next most energy intensive operation is irrigation, contributing 23% of overall energy needs across a mix of diesel and electric irrigation pumps. Therefore, the key areas identified by the report in which operating efficiencies could be gained are from the modifications or upgrades to electric irrigation pumps, installation of drippers as the primary source of irrigation, or kiln heat recovery during drying. The development and deployment of near-infrared analysis has been a key project for our Department of Agronomic Services over the past three years. NIR analysis allows us to reduce inventory and handling of potentially harmful and highly flammable solvents which will improve occupational health and safety in our labs, as well as reduce waste production. Our team partnered with data science company, Segito to build the predictive models using spectrophotometric data. 
Near-infrared analysis has significantly reduced our need for solvent analysis of pre-harvest maturity, bale condition, and our experimental varieties, and has already resulted in a reduction in our Tasmania Labs solvent stock, as shown in the graph on the left. It has also resulted in a reduction in carbon dioxide emissions associated with the production and disposal of solvents, as shown in the graph on the right. The success of NIR analysis has allowed us to eliminate lead conductance value titration, an outdated industry standard methodology, from our lab operations. This is a great result since lead has long been known as a highly toxic metal that also has the potential to contaminate soil and waterways. HPA's Agronomic Services Division has been established to provide the company with a better connection between our hot breeding program and our horticultural practices. It will also oversee the performance of our labs in terms of crop monitoring and analytical procedures. The Agronomic Services Division will be the lead on identifying and delivering sustainability projects. And key information will be fed to management to inform good decision making and facilitate uniform procedures across our farms in Victoria and Tasmania. HPA's hot breeding program is a key element in the sustainability of our business. We prioritise unique flavours in the development of new cultivars. Only select those that demonstrate high stable yield over time, as these are the plants capable of thriving in a commercial context. The aim is to maintain a diverse cohort of experimental varieties so that we can introduce hops to the market that can meet the changing need of domestic and global brewers. Thanks for listening and please stick around for the live Q&A featuring Richard Adamson from Young Henry's Brewery based in Newtown, Sydney, New South Wales. And thanks to George again for pulling all this information together. and uh, taking a deep dive on our sustainability initiatives. I'm Owen Johnston, Head of Sales and Marketing here at HPA, and uh, lucky enough to be joined by two legends. Uh, firstly, uh, I'd like to introduce Richard Adamson from Young Henry's. Go, Richard. Sorry, just got the, the hit the mute button there and put me back on. <laughs> Hi, all the way from my kitchen in Sydney. Thanks, mate. Yes, that's uh, that's the old uh, space bar chat. It should be, uh, you know, in our in, in our scopes nowadays. <laughs> yeah. uh, I think yeah. the computer just decided it was a good time to do a backup, just as you uh, as you mentioned to me. So something jumped in the front. But as 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 always, technology just uh, just just making life easy. So Richard is uh, non-executive director now at Young Henry's. Um, his passion for beer started from a home brewing kit over 20 years ago. Um, I first started hearing about Richard in his uh, adventures at Barron's Brewing uh, from around about 2005 on. Richard went on to start Young Henry's in 2012 um, and uh, added a distillery in there uh, and uh, really became quite well known um, for things like collaborations with the Foo Fighters, um, Kylie Kwong, one of our local chefs and uh, the Art Gallery of New South Wales. There are also industry leaders in sustainability and, and Richard was really top of mind for me to reach out to and, and see if uh, I could uh, get him to contribute um, some of his great knowledge um, to this segment for us. Uh, they've, uh, uh, Richard's gonna talk about some really interesting stuff um, a bit later on. So thank you, mate. Thanks for, thanks for joining us uh, to contribute. Well, absolute pleasure. And of course, Simon Wittick, Dr. Simon Wittick, head of our agronomic services department and um, leading up our breeding program here at HPA. Simon, thanks, mate. It's still, it's still middle of harvest for us, so I appreciate you making even more time for us. Yep. Back again, AJ, thanks. <laughs> All right, if you're listening, uh, watching live, um, please feel free to pop your questions in the chat box and we'll do our best to get to those as we go or, or at the end. First, uh, let's kick off with a couple of questions to, to Simon. Um, for HPA, uh, this is uh, addressing sustainability in this way is reasonably recent. Um, can, you, can you tell us like why did HPA uh, sign up to the UN Global Compact? Yeah, thanks, AJ. Um, it was a, so obviously we have had an interest in pursuing sustainability goals for some time. And 
uh, this at uh, uh, some point a few years ago, this coincided with the, the Global Bath House Group looking for a procedure by which to um, pursue sustainability goals. And in that conversation, as a global group, we decided to focus on the UN Global Compact to give us our guidelines and reporting structures. And uh, fr from there, you know, it was um, HPA, Bath House Group, choosing Global Compact and, and making a commitment through that to one, fulfill the reporting requirements and to set the goals and, and try and achieve real outcomes on the ground. And so the Bath House group of uh, related entity, hop trading entities around the world, uh, you know, uh, this is this is Bath House Germany, uh, Simply Hops in the UK, Haas in America, HPA out this way. Uh, you know, this is this ends up constituting quite a quite a significant undertaking for a, a reasonable portion of of the world's hop trading. Uh, so it's a it's for me it's a really meaningful step for the Bath House group of companies to uh, to go down this path. Yeah, it's, sustainability is a, a large, complex problem. So um, you can either approach it piecemeal and trying to achieve small outcomes in your own right, but you really do need that that structure and those reporting guidelines to um, guide you as to um, the other things that you should actually pay attention to. And Global Compact particularly focuses on human rights and labour rights and things mm -hmm. like that. Mm -hmm. Moving away from the Global Compact, um, you know, water is always a, a pretty hot topic in farming generally. Um, so, you know, coupled with with issues around climate change, what uh, what are we doing to make sure we manage water responsibly and and have an appropriate amount of water? <laughs> Yeah, so our um, pre-existing farms, if you like, in northeast Victoria and Tasmania are um, the land that they are situated upon is associated with access to uh, environmental water in those areas. We're, we're fully irrigated, so it's really, really incumbent upon us to be responsible with how we use that water. Uh, during our expansion, we've made sure that the, the land that we have expanded onto has access to water. And we've also um, committed to a process of, particularly in Victoria, building um, appropriate dam storage to allow us to um, take winter offtake from the rivers and store that as a, um, you know, primarily as an emergency backup mm -hmm. so that we don't have to access the rivers at inappropriate times like in droughts or, um, you know, in, in flood events or in, um, in bushfires, things like that. So just for some context there, uh, all of our farms literally border um, quite major local rivers. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, unlike some um, growing regions around the world that are not irrigated, we, we uh, have that advantage, luxury, uh, but also responsibility. Uh, so, so adequate water rights plus appropriate water management. Management, yeah. Uh, and it's something that... Um, yeah, I guess hop, hop growing in Australia has always relied on irrigation. And for us, it's a matter of um, being responsible about it and getting better at that management. So we're only using exactly what we need mm -hmm. to use to produce you know, a, a good quality crop. If you want to hear more about or see more about um, our growing regions, jump on the hops.com.au website and, uh, and there's a little bit more about the locations um, and uh and some of their attributes so one of the other um hot topics so to speak in sustainability is uh around energy and um uh, around the ass assessment of energy um what um I, I guess it's pretty obvious you would say that we consume quite a bit of energy through the kilning process yeah. and and there is a lot of energy lost as heat through that process mm -hmm. it's um it seems like a hot topic uh -huh. Yes. <laughs> That's your favourite sort of line, isn't it, OJ? <laughs> Gold when you find them. Yeah. Um, yeah, so it, hot, hot production is undeniably energy intensive. Mm. You know, the, the actual horticulture is an intensive horticulture and the, the drying is energy intensive. Um, there are alternative energy sources for hot drying in use around the world and there are alternative kiln structures in use around the world. Um, so that that inter, that um that energy assessment report that we um, participated in 
uh, identified recirculating um, or, or recover, kiln heat recovery mm -hmm. as a potential way to ameliorate the energy intensity of our kilning operations. Um, and that's, that's well and good in theory. It, it sounds obvious, but when you have an existing kiln structure, um, the engineering required to make that safe and viable um, obviously comes at a cost. And we're not at the point now where we can um, make that evaluation and that commitment that that is the right solution for us. Are there other systems around the world that have, have succeeded in that challenge? That you're, that you're aware of? Um, I don't know that I can answer that question mm, uh, mm. precisely, mm. but obviously when you have a, uh, you know, a louvered kiln and you're controlling the, the, the output, um, the humidity of the output air and things like that, mm. you have a better opportunity to recirculate. Mm. Um, but they're, typically yeah, they're a small scale operation. But in no sense um, have we seen like a closed loop system where there's energy regeneration. Not that I'm aware of. Yeah. So there might be some reuse and recirking of yeah. of heat energy in certain kiln designs, but it's not by yeah. far. And I'm really not the right person no, totally. to talk yeah, to yeah, about yeah. the engineering yeah. of hop kilns. So <laughs> a lot better at it than me. <laughs> All right. So back into something that maybe um, is closer to your heart: the uh, the the role of the NIR analysis uh, yes. that we have been talking yep. about quite a bit through this program. Yep. Um, can you tell me how uh, the application of this new technology is is helping our drive towards sustainability? So in the, there's two major ways there. Um, the first one is just in outright solvent use. Um, so when, when we use solvents, which we are obliged to do if we're following the industry standard analytical methods for hop acids, um, we you know, obviously use a lot of toluene, a lot of methanol. Um, we have to handle those safely. We have to minimize exposure to our staff. We also have to dispose of those solvents safely once we've used them. So the way that we have taken on NIR into the business and integrated it into our um, process control systems, we've drawn down our solvent use on each of our production sites from about 600 litres of solvent per year on each site to maybe 60 on each site and, and still going down as we find more ways to use that NIR system. Um, so that in terms of occupational health and safety or staff wellbeing, welfare, mm -hmm. um, and so, and that you know the, the solvents in the environment that, that they're two mm. you know they're, they're small scale wins but mm. you know they're, mm. they're they're a big win in terms of that process absolutely um i, I mean that they are two of the major i would say they are two of the major criteria that we we would seek to address isn't mm. it like it's our environmental impact and, and the safety and well-being of people that's right yeah. they're two of the criteria mm. front and center in mm. global compacts so. mm. mm. it's fabulous all right, well, we've heard uh, a little bit more from Simon um, about the, the journey that HPA has been on, but uh, let's let's hear from Richard. So before we get into it, Richard, um, you in fact teach on the topic of sustainability. Can you tell us a little bit about that? It's one of the many topics that I teach. So uh, I've been uh, teaching Certificate 3 um, in food processing um, in brewing for five years at um, Ultimo. Uh, and sustainability has to be one of the, the topics um, delivered. So uh, yeah, I've, I've done, done some research in the, in the field, not just for what Young Henry's is doing, but just to be able to talk about it a bit more broadly as well. Yeah, that's fantastic. And, the, and I mean, just to, uh, for my gratification there, the, the guys coming out of your Cert 3 in food tech, they're, uh, they're finding a readily useful skill sets and getting jobs in breweries. We certainly are. Uh, so the first first year we had 100 um, percent of students get get work in in the industry. Um, even through the um, the COVID lockdown of 2020, we managed to deliver the course. Um, we moved to um, this environment of Zoom that we're all familiar with now, um, and got and got most of it done. And um, most of those students are and working in the industry. And I've seen a, a big um, uptick this year. Um, for these students have already already getting inquiries um, through TAFE for, um, for skilled hands um, or even just people coming you know, starting the course. So um, the demand for qualified brewers is, is still high. Yeah, and I would say that uh, that trend will continue as, as we're still seeing, I mean, maybe it's taken a bit of a slowdown over COVID, but I'd say we're still getting a new brewery every week here in Australia. So the, the requirements for skilled hands on deck is, is still coming along. 
It is, and look, we've we've been um, through the IBA. We've managed to get um, TAFE in Queensland to deliver the, the course there, and um, our rock star Hendo has been um, been teaching there this year. I think he's had his first bunch of students through, and they they managed to get pick up a, a silver medal at the um, at the local awards there, which is fantastic. And South Australia have been um, running a, a pilot program for trainees as well. Um, we're hoping to get WA and Victoria on the line very soon. Yeah, that's fantastic. I did see the I did see the uh, silver from Hendo and his team. So good on you guys. Well done. All right. So um, back to the young Henry story of sustainability. Um, I'm pretty sure that I've never come across uh, an, a brewery starting up with a sustainability matrix buried in the business plan. So I sort of feel like we've spoken about the journey that HPA is on, but I, I think uh, I think it'd be fair to say we're all on a bit of a sustainability journey. Can can you go behind the scenes at Young Henry's for me and and share some of the journey? Uh, absolutely. And look, we're 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 still on it. Um, we're, we're by no means experts or, um, or perfect in this field. We've got a, a long way to go ourselves. Um, but I guess it started for us um, with uh, the growlers. Um, so having a, a two litre returnable bottle um, as, as when we're at the beginning, it was our only means of being a packaged product. Um, and just when, when you look in, in the impact of what reusing glass can have as opposed to um, even opposed to recycling or not recycling um, has an exponential impact on your carbon footprint. Um, and that kind of sparks your interest from there and seeing, seeing what else you can do. Um, and I guess from there, we, we had a, a few things that happened um, that were very fortunate. One was we got approached by Pingala, which is a community run um, solar project. So they were interested in putting solar panels on our roof, which meant we didn't have to um, stump up for the capital investment initially. Um, we we lease the solar panels on our roof. Um, the the community the Pingala offered the uh, shares in that um, solar panels to the community, and they they bought in, and and it was community funded. They make a return on their investment, and we get solar power at a, a much reduced rate. So that's um that's about twenty five percent of our, our energy, and we're just about to kick that up to fifty. Um, with another Pingala project to put solar panels on the other side of the of the brewery, which is, um, which is going to be great. Uh, and at the same time, we we went for a, a high efficiency brew house with a with the mash filter, um, which reduced our water use and um, also how much grain we have to use as well. Um, so that was that was kind of two big steps we went towards um, sustainable sustainable young Henrys. It's interesting that uh, that dovetail between um, what would you say, like commerciality and and cost effectiveness, and where it uh, where it works in harmony with with a sustainability initiative. And I, and I think that community piece and the solar panels is absolutely fascinating, and would would expect to see more of that down the track. Oh, look, I think so. Not you know, not everyone in in the city can uh, necessarily participate in solar. Um, energy generation. So, um, you know, whether if, you, if you're a, if you're leasing or if you're in a block of flats or something, you can't necessarily put solar panels up. So, being able to um, get on board with a community project and and provide solar um, energy production for industry, I think, is a, a really good thing. Yeah, fascinating. So, how do you sort of mention the uh, the mash press in a way as? Um, an efficiency step and, and a reduction in in grain, say as a as a material input. How how do you uh, conceive of and deal with raw materials from a sustainability point of view? Yeah, I think um, probably the, the the big obviously every every step you can make to um, reduce waste and use less is going to um, have an impact on your sustainability and and, and your bottom line as well. Um, but I think where we look at it, and you know, from our research, it's the one of the biggest carbon cost is is the um, is transport. So if you can reduce your carbon miles for any of your ingredients, it's going to go a long way um, towards your sustainability goals. So uh, you know, using um, hops that are locally grown um, does go a long way towards that. Is is it useful? Is it useful for you as a brewer pursuing your own um, sustainability credentials 
that HPA uh, is is you know a signatory to the UN Compact, and we have active reporting on this stuff. Is that is that useful? One hundred percent, it is useful. Um, you, you know, we're relying a lot on our suppliers to do the heavy lifting with um, sustainability because we're you know we're beer is an agricultural product. Um, you know, we we it's we're nothing without the hops and the grain that goes into the beer, and if if the um, you know if it starts at the at the farm, um, we've we've already we're already ahead, so it it makes a makes a huge difference to us. Yeah, excellent, excellent. That's always nice to know that what we're doing makes a difference. <laughs> uh, I guess um, I sort of feel like you guys have gone one step further, and um, I'd like to I'd like to sort of explore the algae project with you because I think this is a really sort of cutting edge sustainability um, initiative. Can you can you talk to that? I, I, absolutely. So uh, a few um, a few years ago, I was invited to UTS the um, climate change cluster C three and um, have a look at what they were doing in the algae space. Um, and I was, I was fascinated by these green glowing vats that they were all working on. It, it looked like uh, something out of some sort of sci-fi movie. Um, but also that um, yeast was, had this sort of analogy with, with, with algae um, in that it, it almost felt like it, it did the, the, the sisters and they did the opposite job. Um, so yeast, yeast taking in um, sugar and producing CO2, um, alcohol, obviously, um, and algae is taking in um, light and um, CO2 and producing sugar, but basically growing. So I, I kind of thought, well, if we could get those two things in, into some sort of equilibrium or balance, um, you could have a, a closed circuit system within a brewery um, and then we could look at what, what, what uses the algae could have beyond that. And if we could then use the algae for, for further um, uh, carbon reduction or um, you know, just producing a product that was then gonna go have another use, um, then we have, we have something that's very interesting. And that was what kicked off the research from there. And so what, uh, you know, forgive my ignorance, where does the algae, I assume you like yeast in a tank, you end up with a great biomass does that go out to um, animal feed or something like that? It, so algae has so many, so many different uses and it's really the, where we're, the research is focused on now is what that next use is, is going to be. Um, so you, you're right, animal feed is, is certainly one. Um, humans can eat it as well. Um, so there's, a, there's been a fair bit of work on, on supplements for, for humans. Um, it's very valuable as a medium for pharmaceutical manufacturing. Um, and obviously wastewater treatment is, is the other. Um, but the good news is that in, in all cases, it, it needs CO2 um, to, to do its job. So if we can um, capture and um, reuse the CO2 within the brewery, but also you know, the brewery produces more CO2 than you need, put, put that excess into growing the algae, um, you know, it, it's possible that we can get to a, a, a neutral or net negative um, outcome. So like the, the, the sort of blue sky opportunity here is that like even on a big scale of breweries own CO2 demand is pretty much always going to be exceeded by its um, CO2 production from ferment. It, it, do you think the technology will get to a point where a brewery might be CO2 neutral? That's, that's certainly the aim, um, particularly if we can get further reductions um, from using the algae um, afterwards. Um, but uh, you know, I think microalgae is a really fascinating, um, you know, um, little beast. I think you know half of the oxygen that you breathe in comes from algae. Um, and you know, one of one of the the, the, the fascinating stats was this, the the meter square footprint in the brewery that we had the algae back growing in was producing as uh, more oxygen than if the entire side of the brewery was Australian bush. Yeah. Isn't that so, fascinating? It's, yeah. It's just fabulous. Yeah. There you so, go. I'm kind of I'm a little bit scared about that statement about half the oxygen I breathe comes from algae. <laughs> I hadn't really thought of that. <laughs> yeah, so there's diomes in the sea. That's uh, that's producing most of the big. oxygen. Well, that is that is very true. Um, so what uh, what else what else would you like to <clears throat> tell us a story on about uh, about uh, the young Henry's journey. 
I think um, probably the, the message for everybody that's that's thinking about it is that if you you know you, you have you have to measure to understand what you need to control, and when you start looking at that, it can be very daunting. Um, and you know because you look you're looking at energy, agriculture, CO two production, your packaging, distribution, your water, um, it, it, you could it's, you could potentially freeze up at that point and say it's all too hard. I think it's about um, just taking baby steps and, and see what the quick wins are to start with and then working through it um, slowly and methodically. And um, I think, you know, doing something towards this rather than, than nothing is always going to be a positive step. So just um, do what you can within your capacity and, and keep working. At it. Yeah, that's exactly right. I think we're, I think that's, that's pretty much how we Absolutely. approach it <laughs> just yeah. uh, bit by bit. Um, so I guess finally, Richard, um, probably the hardest question or the biggest question has the last one. It's like, what, what do you see in the future? Where, where are we going? And this could be a, a national perspective. It could be right down back to the microcosm of the brewery. Um, what, uh, what's piquing your interest? Where do you see the future lying? Yeah, a great question. Um, you know, I think we, as, a, as an Australia as a nation, is in a, um, a, a pretty challenging part at the moment for, um, for energy production overall um, and, and sustainable path. Um, you know, the coal-fired power stations won't be affordable um, in the future. Um, we're seeing them with a lot of the, the energy generators saying that you know, they're hoping to close them down sooner rather than later. Um, gas, I think, as a, um, as a, a product, well, as a, as a source of energy in Australia, I think the easy gas will, will disappear. Um, you know, we'll have to be looking at fracking and the rest of it. So, as a transition, I think it'll be it'll be useful, but um, long term it won't. So, it's a, it's about having the infrastructure for um, renewable sources, um, and that's in the high high power um, transit transition between the states. Um, it's and it's storage it's storage of energy. Yeah, and uh, you know, I think it'd be fair to say that the changes in the in the energy mix nationally are part of the national conversation and and um they're certainly on our radar as, as something that could potentially impact impact hba yeah, and uh yeah carbon reporting shows that very clearly mm, mm, they do, they... And, it, and it may even be that we have to look at how we we generate our own electricity um more and more i think and how we manage that um and having a picture of what draws energy in your on your site and how you can maybe look at time of use and um, you know, things like soft switches for, um, for refrigeration. Um, it's good. It's, it's an overall management. It's not just as simple as, as plugging things into the wall now. Mm, yeah. And, and the, but some of those techniques are available today, such as the, you know, soft start to avoid those spikes in, in power drawers on, on significant kit there, they're, uh, they're available. Um, you know, even co-generation, uh, there are some examples globally of breweries using co-gen, it, what what do you think about that? Are there barriers to that here in Australia? I, I don't think so. No, I think it, look, uh, as you, you're right, a lot of these technologies are here, and we've implemented some of those things we've talked about, like soft switches. Um, I, I think the the impetus to do so will become more prevalent, though. Um, you know, these things are available. Um, I think there's a there's a fear of cost and and, and hassle, um, but. Uh, I think those those things will just become part of a, a, an operation that you'll have to consider these things. And I think from a cost level, you'll actually find that it's probably going to be cheaper in the long run. Um, yeah, well, certainly as the as it, you know, if the the cost of energy uh, you know per kilojoule goes up, the ROI becomes a bit more compelling. But um, there's also potentially the old legislative big stick where you know the the, the community you know, is heard and people have to start taking this stuff seriously in that way. I, I think so. And, you know, if you look at um, what, what's happening with the UN looking at products like steel, the, the energy used to, you know, to make steel has to be, will have to become from a um, sustainable source. Otherwise, there'll, there'll be a tariff on it. And you may even see that across, you know, all products. So, you know, you guys getting on top of this now as, um, as, as a farmer and a um, producer of hops, you know, if you're looking to export to Europe, that may be a requirement that you, you know, you have all this reporting. So um, it's, it's good to get ahead of it now. 
Absolutely. And, you know, I, I sort of liken it to, um, you know, uh, MRL uh, legislation over in Europe, for, for example, if, if a jurisdiction starts bringing in um, criteria by which you are deemed not suitable to sell your product in their market, we, we need to be, we need to be very conscious of that. That's, um, this is this uh, interface between, you know, commerciality and, uh, and sustainability. It's, yeah, it's a pretty important topic. Yeah, so it's the old, that old triple um, bottom line accounting, I think, that we, you know, it was, it was spotted a while ago. Um, those, those bottom lines will become one. <laughs> you, you'll have to do it. Yeah, good, yeah. good luck untangling them, yeah. <laughs> I guess the other comment I'd make there too is we've been reading for a long, long time about, um, you know, modelling suggesting that market-based mechanisms are preferable, mm-hmm. you know, more efficient in these things, but the reality is those market-based mechanisms haven't got up and running. So the, mm. the legislative side of things, I think, is going to come. Mm. Mm. Yeah, well, it's, um, you know, market-based or um, or it's, uh, or, you know, for one of a, a more friendly term, it's actually self-interest from, That's from right. big corporate yeah. actually making decisions that make sense. I think there's been so much mm. inertia, it's getting mm. to the point where those market-based me- mechanisms are going to be recognised as not having mm. done enough mm. and then mm. we will see legislation coming. Yeah, and I think I think as, you know, as industry leaders um, and as business people, we do have to take leadership in this role. We can't, we can't, we can't rely on government to, to do everything for us. Mm. No, I, I don't think you'll find any uh, disagreement with that statement here. All right, uh, Richard, thank you very much, Simon. Thank you very much. Let's um, let's wrap up the conversation there. I, I, again, uh, quite a fascinating topic for me. Um, Richard, thanks very much for your insightful commentary and um, sharing some of that experience that you've got uh, on your journey. Simon, thanks for shedding some light on, on the HPA journey. And uh, I think it's fair to say that both of our uh, companies are, are going to continue to pursue this. Yeah, absolutely. My pleasure, guys. Um, I am glad to hear Harvest is going well. Fingers crossed, we're pretty close to the end of the uh, March 2021 harvest now. So we'll, uh, with a bit of a fair breeze, we'll get over the line. All right, catch you guys later. All right, thanks very much. A huge thank you to everyone who was part of this session. If you missed some of the action because you couldn't understand our Aussie accents, a recording will be uploaded to hops.com.au forward slash virtual dash harvest. For further information, please email info at hops.com.au and we hope to welcome you all on farm again soon.